Hello and welcome to another episode of Video Game Logic. Today's episode was recorded on November the 22nd, 2022. I'm your host, gaming psychologist, and with me, as always, knowing how to jumpstart a car. Caffeine rage, and I'm not sure if I could 100% say I can. I know of jumping a car, but I've never jumped a car. Right. Well, I mean, technically, I've never jumped a car either. I'm too fat, but... Ah. 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 Anyways, on today's show, we will, of course, be discussing a couple of games that we've played. Sony bans shovelware and easy platinum games. We're going to talk about the Golden Joystick Award winners for 2022. And in the community corner, we're going to be talking a little bit about those NVIDIA melting dongles again. Timestamps will be in the show notes following their respective topics. Hello, Rage. Hello. What's up? Uh, not much. Just trying to find the discovery queue on here because it's the Steam Autumn sale, so they've changed where the hell everything is. <laughs> Even right. though we'll probably not get to it. Eh. Yeah. We'll see. I, uh, <laughs> we're starting later than I thought we would. But, I mean, honestly, like, once I started telling a couple of stories, like, we had a good conversation. It's good Franken content. Plus, it's it's fun to chat. But, yeah, I'm I'm a very tired boy. It is that this week in, in the United States of America land is Thanksgiving. And so that means, for me anyways, I'm not working Thursday or Friday, which means that my already pretty packed schedule is even more packed because it's like, all right, we're trying to get all these people in to make sure they get seen since we're going to be closed Thursday and Friday. So I've had very busy, a very busy two days so far. And tomorrow is also going to be very busy. So I'm a sweepy boy. You're a sweepy boy. Sweepy, sweet, so sweepy, sweeping up everything and then going to bed. But, uh, yeah. How's your week? It's going all right. Uh, you know, prepping for thanksgiving because that's this week yep time to yeah do the things right indeed but yeah we had um you know i've told you this already but for the show purposes we had our house our our commune thanksgiving on saturday Mm -hmm. it was good we had just you know just a bunch of air quotes traditional thanksgiving food but i, I built a fire and just sat in a, out in the backyard by the fire pit <laughs> i was going to say you built a fire then you sat in it <laughs> yeah i was real sad so uh i, I built I, I, I didn't realize you're a buddhist yeah but um so i sat out back by the fire for like five hours saturday very quietly listening to a little music you know but just very quietly. I would talk to people when they came out, but that was that was about it. That was nice. Katie uh, was like, man, your your old man is really showing today. <laughs> like, yes. And your point. So, yeah. What uh, what about you? You got any anything that's up or interesting or do you want to talk about games? Not really. It's been kind of a chill weekend and uh anita's on her uh thanksgiving break so yeah having her around which is nice yeah and having her actually yeah start to relax a little bit because right yeah uh thankfully she gets the entire week off uh the county that we're actually living in that family goes to uh is only three days off but they had a bunch of uh, bus drivers call in and, and basically say, fuck you, we're taking the week off or going hunting or whatever. So they're on, like, all remote learning. <laughs> Unless you actually take your damn kid to school, right? Yeah. I mean, it's funny, <laughs> but at the same time, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, the niece trademark is kind of upset because... Yeah, uh, yeah. Club activities are mostly suspended, but they're also in all the clubs. It's that, that kid uh, is either an overachiever, or her mom pushes her way, 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 way too hard to do everything. Mm. And I'm not yeah. sure which. So yeah, uh, games we played. Sure, games we played. We've we've only got one each this week. 
Do you want to go first, or do you want me to go yeah, first? I, I could go first. I don't think this is going to be terribly long, mostly because this is me going back into the archives, because uh, what I've been playing lately is either Game Club stuff or something that I want to wait a couple weeks to talk about to get some more time with, because it's a little controversial right now. Yeah. Uh, and you know exactly what it is and probably why it's controversial. And I have thoughts on the controversy, but we'll save that. So okay. going back into the archives, I went into Game Pass and played Escape Academy ages ago, but I actually never finished it and I kind of dropped it after a couple play sessions. And not because it's bad. That's kind of the annoying thing, all right? So Escape Academy is essentially a story mode mixed with Escape Room Simulator, where there's, like, this secret underground society of the best escape room artists that are essentially super spies. And you pass uh, this escape room that... The, the, the tutorial escape room, which is... Uh, in this really run down, uh, looks like a little bit of a murder basement. You know, you, I expect to go around the corner and see uh, Jim Stephanie Starling uh, there recording the Jim Inquisition, right? In yes, in the murder basement. So uh, you pass that, and uh, you know the uh, guys uh, hand you a card, which unlocks a, another puzzle, which leads you into the Escape Academy, which is this. Uh, school that's essentially training spies. And the main reason why I fell off this game, well, uh, there's two reasons. One, it's actually very short, and I'm probably about halfway through the game. It's only four to five hours, and I played like two hours of it. Okay. So, right? Uh, but also, whenever they say escape room, uh, they really mean some of the things that pop up whenever the game starts up. Mainly, you know, you need a pen and paper. You need to uh, take notes. Uh, you need uh, sometimes physical objects to be able to go along with it. And it's daunting to want to play that because I, I don't want to sit here and, you know, <laughs> be worried about notes and t uh, write down shit uh, to uh, go do something else, right? Yeah. And that's the kind of the annoying thing is that I was actually enjoying it up until that point where it's like, okay, well... Oh shit, I don't have a piece of paper on me. I, or, yeah, I don't want to get up to go get a notepad or something, right? I'll just play something else, right? And also, it's uh, for how much they hammer home, you know, you know uh, these puzzles and, you know, uh, figuring it out on your, all on your own. It's also incredibly easy to hit the, the hint button. <laughs> the hint button's like, I think it's what's Q or something. Uh, and you're using, uh, you know, WASD to move. So every so often I would, like, fat finger uh, 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 the Q button to, or whatever the hint button was. It was very close to the movement buttons. Uh, to uh, look around and give me a hint to uh, for the puzzle that I'm, you know, not, maybe not even on, right? Yeah. Which was just incredibly frustrating. It does have some interesting, uh, sort of a, uh, of like an advanced, or I should say advanced, like you know, taking the concept of escape rooms and putting them on like video game logic, where there's like this one where you're in essentially a drowning chamber, and if you don't finish the uh, the portion of the room quickly enough, you're, well, you're gonna well drown. Hence the name. And each level uh, interacts with uh, the next one up and uh, and kind of uh, uh, complements the next one. Uh, if I recall correctly, it's like, you know, you're diverting power across uh, uh, different, uh, uh, well, uh, essentially power conduits on the wall. And you have to kind of map it out uh, as it goes up the levels. And it's really neat, and you really can't do that in real life. So it's yeah. you know, kind of that video game logic, but then uh, there's this moment of, okay, well, you have to just decode this cipher uh, that, you know, is like two rooms over on the uh, same level. 
and there's no way that you could actually memorize the uh you know the string of you know like ten characters to be able to get the password for the uh door. So oh, oh you're gonna need pen and paper all of a sudden, right? Yeah. It just kind of stops it, right? And I know, I know, it's a very silly hang up and it's a very uh you know, juvenile thing, perhaps. But I would have loved to have some sort of the you know in-game way to take notes, or even just a, you know, a quick screenshot function. You know? Or something like that. And yes, I know I could take screenshots on the computer uh, and uh, tab out and everything, but it's still breaking the immersion. And considering how much they try to hammer home the immersion of the uh, of the escape rooms. Right? Yeah. And also, there is the general kind of video game logic of... Uh, on some of the more complex ones that I did, uh, it even though you were able to figure it out without all the clues, it still forced you to go through uh, all the uh, essentially steps, like uh, the third or fourth puzzle uh, is to figure out the headmaster's uh, name. Otherwise, they're going to kill you because you know they can't let you live if you you know you don't know your stuff. Blah blah blah. And uh, it's in, uh, like, three, essentially, puzzle chains. And I figured it out based off of uh, uh, some other uh, clue. I can't remember which. Or, yo, can't remember, you know, uh, you know the, that leap of la- logic that I figured it out. But because I didn't figure it out through the, all the steps yet, it wouldn't let me input the final uh, thing, which is irritating. And it's also very easy to overlook very small details. Like, uh, one other portion of that uh, was uh, the middle initial, which I couldn't get for a long time until I realized, oh, there was a key in that one pocket of the coat that was way down in there, and you had to basically look directly at the pocket to interact with it. Right? And whenever whenever you enter the puzzle rooms... Yeah, much like a real life one, you know, you do kind of the scan of, you know, figure out, okay, what do I need to uh, figure out? Or, you know, what's kind of, you know, guiding me somewhere? Well, I looked at the coat, but I didn't look at that one exact pocket. <laughs> right? Yeah. And that was kind of a kick in the teeth. Uh, and they do have a very interesting narrative. It is a very short one. And it seems like the uh, DLC pass that they're putting, it looks like putting out, question mark? Because they say a season pass, but they only have one DLC on Steam. So I'm not sure if they're still working on it or what, but... Or if it's just, yeah, one DLC and the season pass is a separate thing. It's a little tough sell at 20 bucks for, yeah, a four-hour game. I know, I know. You're you're getting to the kind of the, uh, you know, dollar for hour thing and, you know, enjoyment, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but, yeah, for... Something that's not that doesn't have a lot of replay value, and a very kind of truncated uh, narrative. It's kind of a hard sell, although it does have some very cool moments. And I do wonder if, uh, yeah, they're going to expand upon this world that they're building up, or what? Because right, yeah. It does look like they're still working on the game, and uh, the season pass is uh, essentially ten new escape rooms, which I'm I'm not sure if that uh, doubles the uh, overall uh, content or what. Uh, it does seem like it does a quite a, a amount of uh, content compared to the original game, though. So there is that. But that's, yeah, also nearly doubling the price of the game. So, ew, right? Yeah. Uh, definitely worth checking on, uh, uh, on Game Pass, especially if you are you know, have even a passing interest in escape rooms. Uh, but they mean it whenever they say, you're going to have to take notes, you're going to have to uh, figure out some things, possibly, you know, uh, with uh, some... Uh, leaps of logic or, you know, having to map out shit. Because, like, uh, one of the uh, puzzles was, you know, a mapping puzzle, which was, mm, all right. Yeah. So, yeah. 
And it does have a uh, co-op as well. So there is that. It's very much like uh, the We Were Here series uh, on that one. Although right. uh, the We Were Here series kind of overstayed its welcome, it seemed like. so. It got a little out of hand, I think. I don't I don't know. Maybe we could we could talk more about that and mm. at another point, like sit down and think about it and talk about it. Because mm. we played the first two to completion and we played half mm-hmm. of the third one and we stopped. But we never went back to it. But Yeah, and they have the fourth one now? Yeah. Oh, so uh that's uh, Escape Academy. Definitely worth checking out on Game Pass. I'm not sure about uh its uh value money wise though. If it's a good value or not. Yeah. Okay. Well, my uh, the only game I played this week, uh, well, the only new game I played this week, I guess, um, is a game called Mindustry. So Mindustry is a game that I had had on my Steam wishlist for quite some time. Um, and it was a couple weeks ago. Maybe a couple months ago. I'm not sure. It, it was re- relatively recently on sale for like a dollar. And I was like, you know what? I could I could play a new game. I could go, you know, play something for a dollar. Like, that would be good. You know, get this. Check it out. I haven't played a ton of it yet. couple hours. Got through the initial starting point. So I might come back and talk about yeah, this more later. I've gone full spaghetti yet. Yeah, I haven't gone full spaghetti yet. So, but I, I might come back to this in a couple hours, or in a couple hours, and you know, in a couple weeks, and and talk about it. It's off to a good start. So, what Mindustry is, is it's putting together kind of three concepts. The first being the, um, I mean, really Factorio. There's some other games that do this, you know, gathering resources, crafting, building a factory style thing. Like there's some some games, some other games that do that, but this feels very Factorio inspired. So I'm going to say it's one part Factorio, it's one part tower defense, and it's one part real time strategy. So those three elements no, don't like one part Creeper World. I have never played Creeper World, so possibly. Uh, Creeper World's a RTS where you're building essentially a power grid uh, to push back the gray goo. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. There are some similarities to that then. So you are, there's two planets in the game um, that serve as the campaign and you are colonizing these planets and it's got sort of the easier planet and the more advanced planet um, the easier planet has a tutorial and has simpler levels, whereas the advanced planet um, has got more resources, and, but much more complicated and complex levels, at least based on the descriptions. I've only looked at the easier planet, but it will let you play both of them at the start, and you can sw- jump back and forth, um, and you have shared progress on sort of your your main like drone thing like that represents your character, but I'm I'm getting ahead of myself, so... What what you're doing is you're colonizing these alien worlds um, and you drop down in the starting area and it does the tutorial for you. And the Factorio-esque portion comes in is, is that you're a little you're, you're piloting a floating drone or flying drone that has a a couple of basic tools. Um, you've got a basic crafting sort of beam. You've got a mining beam, and then you've got a basic gun. And initially, you gather the resources yourself to transport them back to your base. You know, copper, um, coal, etc. Um, gather them, transport them back to your base. Then you spend those resources on upgrades and unlocking stuff on the tech tree, which allows you to, you know, get on the proverbial treadmill of miners conveyor belts, um, advanced conveyor belt systems, uh, weapons, defenses, new factory type buildings um, for unit production, and so on and so forth. You know, you, you get on the treadmill. And the ultimate goal is to wipe out the aliens on the planet and colonize the entire planet. And the planet has a grid that you expand out from, uh, expand out from uh, for a particular biome. And after you have 
collected enough resources and beaten enough areas in a specific biome, then you unlock the next one. So you start out in kind of this cold, wintry, badlands type of biome that's pretty... Uh, all of the levels are, are pretty straightforward. You know, the enemy spawns, for example, to the north, and your base is to the south. And so it's, air quotes, easy to predict and defend where the, the enemy waves come from for the tower defense portion. Um, and you can build your base accordingly. And then I have unlocked the second area, which is a forested kind of swampy area that is much more intricate and complicated with multiple entrance points to the map. One of them is not easily identified as where the enemies are coming from. You start more in the center. So there are multiple points of ingress that the enemy could attack from that you have to defend your base from. So that's, but that's the, the factorial aspect you, you know, build can, uh, automated miners and conveyor belts to ferry resources around initially to just the starting structure that serves as a warehouse where that you can directly build from the, the unit pool to build turrets and other bases and research stuff. But then later on, there are other buildings you can unlock to feed the resources into to create other types of units or advanced research materials. Um, the, the tower defense portion I've kind of already talked about. It, there are waves of enemies that spawn in, just like in a tower defense game. You can use the land to your advantage as well as crafting walls and other barricades to slow down or otherwise direct the enemies. They will stop to attack the walls that you build um, if if it makes sense for them to do so. I, I'm not sure. It, I'm sure there's a way to exploit the AI on this, but for the most part, it seems that they will try to go around unless the only direct path is through your walls, in which case they will stop to destroy them. So you can create some winding paths, but... Amazing. Yes. Um, there are, of course, ground-based and air-based enemies, and you unlock a variety of turrets to deal with the various enemies. Um, and you must feed your turrets resources so that they have ammunition to shoot. Um, I'm not sure if there are energy weapons later on that don't require ammunition directly but perhaps some other type of way to charge them up but the basic turrets shoot bullets that are implied or sort of fabricated on site and you feed the raw resources into the turrets to to build the to to for them to craft the ammunition um and then the rts portion of the game lay a little bit later on i can like see them in the tech tree and have seen in like the trailer for the game um you can upgrade both your drone and craft other vehicles of some kind, other drones. It looks like at, at a certain point in the game, you are going to have to take out um, units that you've created and lead them into open combat to defeat the enemy aliens. Um, and that's it. If there's any story for why you're out on this adventure, like this game is still in active development. It's not listed as early access, I don't believe. Let me double check. Mm -hmm. mm, no, it's not listed as being in early access, but the game is still receiving active development. It recently had its 7.0 update. Um, so if there's story that pops up along the way, haven't found it yet. It just seems to be that your job is to eradicate these aliens and get all the resources on this planet. So colonialism, I guess, is the story. Also, but, you're English. <laughs> yes, true. Very true. So, it it apparently has like uh, they, has they need to have a uh, sorry they need to have a mod where your little floating drone has a little uh you know United Kingdom flag on it. Yes, that would be adorable. I mean, terrifying but adorable. But um, there are it, it does support some community content right off the bat, community made maps and base schematics. Um, there's also public servers where you can play co-op with people there's pvp matches obviously i have not tested out co-op or player versus player to see how that works um but overall it's it's off to a promising start it controls well um everything makes sense um so far it hasn't thrown too many curveballs other than the fact the only thing that and this is a personal preference the only thing i don't like is that because it's um tower you know one part tower defense as soon as you start the waves, like as soon as the first waves start, then they're coming. You know, you can make the waves come early, but you can't pause them, mm -hmm. which means that, you know, you can be overwhelmed and lose um, 
which, you know, that sucks. Granted, you know, that's kind of the point of a video game, right? You you play, you win or you lose. But this type of game to me is not usually something that can be punctuated by failure. Um, I guess technically you can fail in Factorio, you can get wiped out and, and killed, but I've honestly never had that happen. I've never been wiped out by the aliens in Factorio. But I feel like, you know, that that timer click, you know, counting down the next wave makes me feel some anxiety. So who knows? Maybe I'll never actually fail in this game either. And it's more for making you feel like you might fail as opposed to actually making you fail. But boy, howdy, like seeing that timer tick down to the next wave. It's like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready yet. Hold on. I mean, that's kind of a trip of the RTS or not well, RTS as well, but the tower defense genre. Yeah, absolutely. I accept that as a conceit of the game, but it's like more stressful than I thought it would be when I started playing it. But yeah, overall, first impressions, this is like a solid B to B plus game. Like, it's definitely worth the two bucks I paid for it. If you like this kind of game and it's on sale, you know, whenever you go to look at it, it's worth a few bucks. I'd say it's worth at least five bucks. Um, It's normally priced at 10. Who knows? Maybe if you like this kind of stuff, it's worth the full 10 to you. But I definitely think it's worth a couple bucks on sale for sure. I mean, they do have the uh, Steam Autumn sale. Uh, it doesn't look like it's on sale this time around, but there is always uh, Black Friday and you know, the, ho- the winter sale, right? Yeah. This says it's currently on sale for four twenty four. dollars oh, For some reason, I didn't see a sale. No, no, it's on sale on Steam. Uh, the What is it? The Chrome extension? Steam Enhanced. Mm-hmm. It's on sale on Fanatical Games for five bucks. Oh, uh, okay, okay. See, I don't have that on Firefox. So, so you're seeing a sale on another site, not yeah, Steam. yeah. And then the historic low is a dollar. It was one dollar back in April. That's probably when I bought this. So it turns out you would buy that for a dollar. I would buy that for a dollar. But yeah, that's it for games played this week. One for you. One for me. So, uh, let's, let's move on. Woo. Our first news topic of the night, Sony bans shovelware and easy platinum games. So just in case anyone listening doesn't, is not aware, this is not the platinum game studios, but this is pl- platinum, a platinuming a game. That's harder to say than I thought. Platinum, it would be. Num- 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 yeah, uh, it's when you I'm getting a platinum title for getting all the t- uh, all the achievements in the game. Correct. Um, Xbox uses gamer score. PlayStation uses platinum trophies to indicate that you have 100 percented a game with all of its achievements. And, and just how big your EP is, right? Yep. Okay, Be- so this sounds really weird, but it makes a lot of sense. But once you look at some of these games. There's going to be a link to a video from a YouTuber highlighting a few of these gems. And the entire... uh, If you remember about four or five years ago when there was the big, you know, massive glut of achievement farming games on Steam, it's about the same level of quality on these. For the most part. Yeah. Where it's... You know, load up the game and do, you know, either hold a button or do something for a roughly five minutes uh, to get a platinum trophy for a couple bucks. Rinse and repeat. And it seems like it's a, you know, a handful of companies really pushing this. And it's just kind of scummy because, you know, it's, it's tying into the whole, uh, you know, kids wanting to have all the platinum trophies and, you know, outdo their friends, right? Yeah. I have two minds about this. I'm happy that they're like trying to crack down on shovelware titles, but I don't care if a game has easy achievements so that someone can feel accomplished by getting them all. You know, like that part of it doesn't bother me. Well, I think it's more them trying to clean up the uh, the e store because, right? Yeah, that's and that's fair. I think that's something that they should be trying to do is to clean up the shop. Um, but. You know, I'm I'm just curious to see if this is going to have a knock on effect on other games achievements and because achievements do. I mean, 
I don't know how you feel about achievements. I don't know if we've ever had this conversation before. Achievements, to me, are a way to make single-player games a little more competitive and a little more interesting to have conversations with with people about. It, to me, it really depends on the game. Because there's some games that does achievements really well. Uh, and it's uh, sometimes even adds uh, to the uh, game. I mean, my favorite achievement moment is in Portal 2, uh, where you're, uh, you know, suddenly in the death trap that Wheatley set up, uh, sets up. You know, this is the part that he kills you, uh, chapter title. Well, this, uh, this is, I guess this is the part where he kills you, and then achievement pops up. This is the part where he kills you. This is that part. Yeah. And that still stands out to me as one of the best, like, essentially, uh, wall break moments that involved an achievement. Yeah. And then there's goofball achievements like, you know, the Stanley Parable, which is, you know, it's entire, you know, like, other category. Where, you know, load up the game on, like, a Tuesday at a certain time. Or not play the game for five years. Or, you know, something like that. I think I'm probably eligible for that one. Not play the game in five years, then play it again. Mm-hmm. Or see all the uh, endings, or, yeah, do certain things. Uh, but then there's ones that are just, yeah. Uh, just paying the asses for the sake of it that I don't like at nearly as much. I mean, stuff like, uh, okay, pro- uh, controversial time. Stuff like Little Rocket Man from the Half Life uh, 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 episode two, where you know you're taking this dome from the very beginning of the episode to the very end, mostly because of several sections where. Yo, you have to try to, like, wedge it in this car that you have, right? Yeah. And have to deal with the physics engine. I mean, I know you don't have to do stuff like that, but, right? Yeah. For me, that's where I'm saying that, like, they, they make single-player games a little more either interesting to talk about or competitive, depending on how you think of it. Because it's a way to to, like, have proof, like, yes, I did this really difficult or complicated or weird thing. Like, for no other reason other than because I, I wanted to, and here's the proof that I did that. Like, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that doesn't matter at all. It doesn't mean anything. But everyone likes to feel good about the things that they achieve, the difficult things that they pull off. And mm-hmm. so, you know, that's a way to be like, look at this cool, hard thing that I did in this game that I like. That part, that aspect of it. And like, yes, I do think that they can elevate certain games, certain stories, or certain you know, when they're used in a creative way to break the fourth wall or to punctuate a particularly difficult or interesting moment. Um, they can also serve as a way to break tension. At least the first time you go through something, you know, you get an achievement after a really hard moment and then you get that little shot of dopamine. It's like, okay, I don't feel quite so bad. I got an achievement, you know? Mm-hmm. So they can be used to great inf- effect to enhance things, or they can, you know, they can still be fine if they're just there, like, to be able to list off your accomplishments, you know, something to strive towards, an extra little completion thing. I think achievements overall are good, but, you know, and, and I don't think there's a problem with games that have super duper easy achievements as well, if that makes someone feel better. But again, going back to the actual, you know, article at hand or topic at hand. Yeah, shovelware titles are a problem everywhere you go. No matter which platform you're on. Yeah, and having, you know, something that's literally like JPEG dot, you know, shitty truck slide across the screen, right? Yeah. Uh, that's going to be in the video. Um, one of them is literally just hold a, a, a button on the controller and let the truck, you know, kind of jitter across the screen over and over again, and it raises the score. And once it goes to past a certain point, you get your platinum achievement. Although they do, you know, put an incredibly small amount of effort where, you know, the achievements will kind of tie into one another, like the one giraffe one, where the giraffe is just kind of fading in and out because Mm -hmm. it's eating leaves and, you know, you're getting score for all the leaves, right? Yeah. Uh, they're, you know, give me like giraffe facts or factoids or whatever, right? Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, like completing uh, the sentence from the previous one, like, you know, uh, uh, a giraffe's tongue uh, is black and 
it, it, it is so tall that its deck cannot reach the ground. Right? Yeah. But it's still annoying. <laughs> and trying to wade through all the shit on the store and find stuff like that. Especially if you're tr- uh, trying to find a game that you know, you haven't played before you know, you know, or something new, right? And I'm not sure if the Sony store you could sort by new or you know, by you know, uh, recently uh, added uh, that easily. But having stuff thrown in there like that, having to wait through it, right? Mm-hmm. On top of that, the, you know, exploiting little kids. Because let's be honest, a, a fair amount of this would be uh, kids wanting more platinum trophies than their friends, so they're gonna buy you know all the shitty shovelware titles, spend ten bucks and get five t- platinum titles, and talk about how many uh, yeah platinums they got uh, last night, right? Yeah, and, and I know, I know, I sound like old man yells at cloud on that, but you do, you care. definitely do, but and I have a point too. Yeah, one thing I mean, that I, I, I do. I, uh, well, I was just going to say, I don't have a problem with them uh, banning games like this. Especially ones that are built around the entire idea that they're just going to swap out the assets and re-upload it as a completely different game. <laughs> because you know that truck game... Well, first of all, it's up there twice because they have the, the Nitro version that has Nitro Drop JPEG on the tailpipe, right? <laughs> yeah. But you know that that particular game probably has a dozen different versions from that company. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, you were saying. Right. One thing I like to do, and this is just, I don't even think this is part of the competitive aspect. I just find it interesting. I like to, to look at games achievements to see, like, uh, how many people got this one? How many percentage of people got that one? Like, I, I find that interesting. I think that I, says. Yeah, I, I do that sometimes as well. I think that says something about the way that most people play games. And it's like, which, you know, who do I line up with and who do I not? One of my favorite things is to look at the most common achievement that I don't have and the most rare achievement that I do have. Yeah. Especially, uh, well, the probably the best example of that one would be like Hunter Call of the Wild, which is, uh, is very much in line for Game, uh, Game Club of the Year this year because, right? Yeah. And seeing like, what is the most common achievement I don't have, and because there's so many DLCs, it's like, okay, well, it's probably going to be an early DLC that, you know, I just have it done. Okay, now now I'm curious. Uh, the most common achievement I don't have is persistence is futile. Find 100 tracks from the same animal. Uh, I got that one recently, actually. Mine is blind spot. Hit an animal that is barely visible. And then uh, beyond that... It's date night. Harvest a male and a female roe deer from the same herd. See, the rarest achievement I do have... Ascended. Complete the mission, the ascent. Yeah, I know. Uh, mine is gobble gobble, harvest 50 turkeys. Which I got last Sunday. Yeah. Which, if you don't count that one... Uh, the truth is in the Mazanania... Uh, complete the Carolina Vargas mission arc, uh, a DLC uh, missions uh, thing, or camper harvest an animal from a hunting structure in Medved, which kind of tells you, you know, one, just how few people actually played that map, but also how few used the hunting structures, right? Yeah. Now I'm looking at Chivos on other games, too. I just like to go look at Battletech. Battletech is one of the games, like, (laughs) I've got so many hours in it, but I've only got about three quarters of the achievements. Like, a lot, I don't have, I have almost none of the multiplayer achievements. Nobody plays multiplayer on Battletech Mm -hmm. anymore. Yeah. Unless you're like... Yeah, it was so disappointing to see uh, just how the uh, multiplayer worked in Battletech. It should have been co-op. Yeah, it should have been. But beyond that, I play with so many mods, like doing multiplayer is next to impossible anyways. I'm also missing much of the skirmish mission or the skirmish ones where you, you know, do the multiplayer style, but against the the bot. But like, I've got almost all of the single player achievements 
from the the campaign or the career mode. I'm missing a couple, but like I've got an achievement that only 02 percent of players have. Ooh, fancy. Yeah, complete a career mode score at legendary rank. Ooh, there's there's only one more achievement I'm missing that's purely single player that's more difficult, which is called a career unheard of in over two centuries, which is complete uh, career mode with a score of what's called Kerensky, Mm -hmm. which is, I mean, you have to get a perfect career mode score, which is a thousand points or no hundred thousand points. Something is damn tough. Yeah. Like, I mean, you have to have the maximum of everything. And basically rush through uh, it as well. Yeah. What's kind of annoying is the game I've been... Well, uh, another one I've talked about before too long is uh, RimWorld, the new DLC, but that I don't think actually has achievements. So, mm, all right. Oh, yeah. RimWorld does not have achievements. Interesting. Well, modding, right? Although there is a mod achievement thing that kind of ties into a lot of DLCs uh, that... Uh, that one's kind of interesting because it actually gives you points in the game that you could spend for specialty things. Like it could spawn a quest, it could spawn a, a random uh, caravan, it could make somebody yeah you know, give you a random uh, uh, person joining. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, you, know, you have to work your way up to that. Uh, what? I actually have, ooh, that's one I've been meaning to play, and it does not have achievements. That, that's the annoying, is that uh, the other one I've really been, uh, really sunk a lot of time into, uh, Euro Truck, of course. I've been playing that a little bit on and off recently. Although, yeah. I only have a handful of achievements because, yeah, uh, a lot of the achievements are tied to DLC or they're, you know, like, explore the entire map. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, we're getting way off topic. Yeah. Surprise, surprise. I, I mean, I mean we, we definitely you know, uh, are in favor of the idea of achievements, but you know, view them very differently. Yeah. All right. Uh, you ready to do the next one, then? Yeah. Uh, time for a long one uh, to definitely not totally pad out a uh, show that would have been very short because of no news on Thanksgiving week, right? Yeah. So yeah, the uh, Golden Joystick Award winners of 2022. So uh, do we want to just go from the bottom and head to the top since they have, you know, like Game of the Year and everything right at the top? Sure, that's fine by me. And I- I'm fine with skipping a couple, of, uh, especially the eSports stuff. Works so, for me too. So do we want to talk about Best Game Trailer? <laughs> I haven't looked at any of these. I don't watch. I don't watch trailers. I don't watch trailers for games. I don't watch trailers for movies. I don't watch trailers for anything. I, I'll watch trailers for like updates for shit, like uh, the uh, teaser stuff for Satisfactory, uh, which I've even touched Satisfactory Six because Satisfactory Update Seven is in the works now. And yeah, it, and I just don't want to get invested. So uh, Goat Simulator Three won that one. Yep. Yep, didn't even know they were making Goat Simulator 3 until... Just uh, I think it's moment. already out. Didn't know they made one until just this moment. So, best early access launch. Disney DreamWorks... Sorry, Disney Dreamlight Valley. Slam Rancher 2. Dune Spice Wars. Core Keeper. Vampire Survivors. Or Gloomwood. Yep. Was aware of some of these. Uh, Disney Dreamlight. Slime Rancher. Dune Spice Wars. Vampire Survivors. Mm-hmm. I was aware of all of those. I've heard good things about Slime Rancher and Vampire Survivor. Have heard nothing about Dune Spice Wars, and I've heard Disney Dreamlight Valley is bad. A uh, Disney Dreamlight Valley is essentially a cash grab. I mean, it's Disney, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a friend that's big into it, but yeah, she's basically said it's basically uh, yeah, uh, um. Now, now I'm completely blanking on the title. <laughs> oh, I hate it when you when I do that, right? Yeah, but I, I'm not I'm not sure what you're going for. So I don't. Uh, think animal. I'm... It's basically Animal Crossing meets uh, 
Disney. I had a brain fart, and then I thought of it. Right. Basically, I, I a lot of creative that. stuff only if you like Disney stuff, which turns out if you, uh, yeah, Disney stuff is pretty much everything these days. True. So, uh, Slime Rancher won it. I haven't touched it yet. I never even touched the first one, so, all right. Yeah, I haven't, I mean, I played Slime Rancher won a decent amount. I find it very enjoyable, mm-hmm. but I haven't checked out the second one yet. So, do you want to take Studio of the Year? <laughs> or do you yeah. want to take that one? No, we'll do that one real quick. Studio of the Year, they had Roll 7, Terrible Toy Box, Half Mermaid, From Software, Interior Night and Tribute Games. Uh, From Software won it. Elden Ring, I suspect, is going to show up several times on this list. Um, Mm -hmm. I've already seen it one other time as I was scrolling down the page. So, you know, but I mean, From Software is the only one that I know on that list. Yeah, well, uh, Roll 7 is Ali Ali. An Ali Ali world, yeah, the skateboarding game. Okay, yeah. Um... A uh, terrible toy box is uh, Thimble uh, Weed Park and Return to Monkey Island. Okay. Uh, with, uh, I'm quickly Googling these because, right? Uh, what is this one? Um, Half Mer- uh, Mermaid is Immortality, which uh, made a fairly decent splash. Uh, it's the uh, full motion video game or uh, one of the newer ones. Mm-hmm. Or they're the publisher of it, at least. Uh, Interior Night is Quantic Dream. All right. Yeah. And Tribute Games, which is a terrible, terrible name. Oh, they're the teenage, the teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game. So, or at least that's their most recent one. Gotcha. Uh, so, yeah, uh, some fairly solid uh, ones all around, but yeah. Uh, it's not going to stand up against From Software, especially this year, right? Yeah. So the Still Playing Award, which is, you know, for games you're still playing. Genshin Impact, The Sims 4, Destiny 2, Final, Final Fantasy 14. I had to sit and translate the uh, Roman numerals there for a moment. Minecraft, Fortnite, Pokemon Go, Apex Legends, Lost Ark. Or the Elder Scrolls Online with Genshin Impact taking it. But I could see that. I mean, Genshin Impact, I fell off of it because of the gotcha mechanics, but I definitely could see a good game there despite it. Yeah, I know quite a few people who play it a lot. I mean, they're all clients of mine in high school, um, but they play it and they really enjoy it. So, you know, more power to them. I mean, I don't think that there's a, a terrible game on the list. I mean, Objectively. Subjectively. Fortnite. Fortnite, objectively terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no, you, no arguments. I won't hear them. It's bad. Yeah. Well, at least it wasn't uh, Skyrim. Uh, so, um, uh, you'll take the next one? Yeah, Xbox Game of the Year. They had Halo Infinite, Scorn, Grounded, As Dusk Falls, Sniper Elite 5, and Dying Light 2 Stay Human. Interestingly, also serves as the PC Game Pass list for the most part. Pretty much, actually, right? Yeah, but it but, went but, to Grounded. Is Grounded the one where uh, yeah, you play uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? Yeah, thing? it's uh, Honey, I Shrunk uh, the uh, Survival uh, uh, Sandbox game. Right. Although well, there is a story there. It's not you know, technically Survival Sandbox. It's more Survival RPG. But, uh, yeah, definitely don't... Uh, you don't want to play that? Because there's giant ass spiders. Giant spiders, yeah. Uh, I, I do laugh that Halo Infinite didn't get the uh, nod because, right? Halo Infinite had a lot of problems, though. It was. I think it still has a lot of problems. It was panned quite a bit when it released. I, I mean, uh, the, I mean, apart from, I think Halo Infinite was there just because, you know, it has to be. But I, I don't have a problem with Grounded. I'm a little tired of uh, the survival, you know, first person thing. Although it does put an interesting spin on it, so there's that, right? Yeah. So, uh, PlayStation Game of the Year. Uh, Gran Turismo 7, Horizon Forbidden West, Stray, Elden Ring, 
The Last of Us Part 1, or Sifu, with Stray winning it, which I have no problem with Stray getting a nod there. It is yeah. a very short game, but it's impressive with what they pulled off, and I do hope that they continue the story. Yeah. I'm surprised it didn't go to Horizon Forbidden West or Elden Ring. True. Or Last of Us? Feels weird to say that since Last of Us mm-hmm. 1 is, uh, what, six, seven years old now? Something like that? Yeah, I know it got remastered this year, but. Yeah, it got remastered this year and panned for, you know, pretty much just upping the price and, you know, putting the uh, textures through an AI <laughs> upscaler, essentially. So, hmm. Uh, yeah. I heard some uh, nasty things about Gran Turismo Seven. I'm not sure if they fixed it or if I, you know it's just you know uh, angry fan saber alley. Yeah, I don't know. I'm unfortunately. I know. Th- I know. I had a behind on Gran Turismo. I- I'm like well six uh, behind on Gran Turismo. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so yeah, so you get PC game of the year. <laughs> yeah. So neon white. Return to Monkey Island, Hard Space Shipbreaker, Teardown, Total War Warhammer 3, or Warhammer 40,000, Chaos Gate, Demon Hunters. Uh, I mean, Shipbreakers is the only one I've played on that list. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I that didn't sh- win. No, it did not. The winner was Return to Monkey Island, which I have heard mostly good things about, but I haven't yeah. played it, probably won't play it. Yeah, I'm taking a quick look. Uh, the, okay, Neon White's the one I thought was thinking of. It's basically a speedrun FPS with a card deck building thing going on. Yeah. Which is interesting. Uh, it's I'm a little shocked to see Hard Space Shipbreaker you know, get, get a, you know, even a nomination because, right? It would have like a really culty kind of niche... Maybe cults is wrong when I say it, but I feel like it had a pretty strong following from, you know, kind of like a vocal vocal few kind of deal. Ooh, Teardown looks interesting. Why did I not see this before? Uh, prepare the perfect heist. Oh, okay, so I, I misread it. Uh, prepare the perfect heist in a simulated and fully destructible voxel world. So it's a heist game with a destructible environment. If, I feel like I've seen this before somewhere. I, it might have been on Discovery Q, and I just didn't mention it, or, or uh, yeah, uh, or I might have uh, mentioned it and I just didn't put it on my wish list because, right? Yeah. Uh, for for a moment there, I thought it was a dis- yeah, like yeah, the sandbox destructible game, All right? Yeah. All right. So you're up. Okay, so I get the di- uh, the Nintendos, Nintendo Game of the Year, Xenoblade Chronicles Three. Pokemon uh, Legends Arceus, or Arceus, depending on uh, your uh, which side of the pond you're on. Kirby and the Forgotten Land, Live Alive, Platoon 3, or Nintendo Switch Sports with Pokemon Ar- Legends Arceus winning. I've played a couple of these. I've put a lot of time into Splatoon, I've put a lot of time into Arceus. Yeah. And, and uh, honestly, as much as I like Pokemon Legends Arceus, I don't think it's a game of the year thing. It, I mean, this one just feels like the uh, Pokemon. Yeah, you know, I definitely. Uh, yeah, you have to click on that uh, because there's some really impressive shit going down with uh, Kirby and the Forgotten Land. Uh, of course, Xenoblade Chronicles. Well, two three is like the one uh, m- uh, massive multiplayer shooter on uh, Switch uh, these days. Although it's been plagued with some connection uh, connectivity issues, because right, yeah, but that's you know just Nintendo's infrastructure, you know, uh, buckling and weaseling, uh, but Being also far behind the curve. Yeah, although there is a lot of content there, uh, I'm disappointed to see that not uh, get uh, more of a nod. Yeah, although who knows, maybe this will nod them into doing more uh, Legends games. Because uh, Pokemon Legends Arceus, that was the one that was essentially pseudo Monster Hunter uh, with the Pokemon uh, uh, formula, where it released you into a uh, essentially not full on open world. Uh, that's coming later, and I'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. Hang on there. 
uh, uh, but pretty big maps and changed up a few of the core mechanics of the uh, game with a, more of an emphasis on story and telling, uh, you know, essentially lore of the world. Yeah. And there's definitely more uh, room for uh, games like that, or, you know, more games like that one in the series. So anyway, continuing on. Yeah, very get, long a, one. You get a long one. <laughs> the most Unless... wanted game. Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Final Fantasy 16, Assassin's Creed Mirage, Dead Island 2, Forspoken, Street Fighter 6, Star Wars Jedi Survivor, Warhammer 40k Darktide, Hong- Honkai Star Rail, Starfield, Exoprimal, Redfall, Hogwarts Legacy, The Day Before, Mass Effect, Marvel Spider-Man 2, Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth, Hollow Knight Silk Song, Curl Space Program 2, and Dead Space. And the winner was Legends of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. A game I have not heard of. Uh, that's the uh, sequel to Breath of the Wild. Right. Okay. You want some interesting like time manipulation shit going on uh, as the gimmick for that one? Uh, that's uh, was in the uh, Nintendo... Oh, okay, so... That was announced like three months ago. This is the one that they had the big reveal about the name, and they uh, didn't stream it into the uh, uh, to the UK. And they actually canceled their stream to the UK and forced them to where it's the American stream because it seemed a little bit of a gauche move to talk about Tears of the Kingdom, yeah, you know, right after the Queen fucking dies, right? Yeah, I mean, out of the list, yep. Yeah, uh, I am looking forward to playing Tears of the Kingdom. Uh, I still actually need to finish Breath of the Wild. Yeah. Um, obviously, Carbal Space Program 2. I mean, uh, a lot of this is like... You know, I'm interested in seeing just uh, uh, how much of a dumpster fire Starfield is. I hope that Bethesda could, could uh, pull it around, but at the same time... Eh, right. Yeah. And a lot of these are you know, genres that I just don't really care about. I, I've gotten to the point where I really don't care about Final Fantasy anymore. I, I've seen some of the stuff for Final Fantasy 16, and it just seems kind of shit. I'm not sure if it's just I've gotten out of JRPGs. Actually, I can't even say I, I'm out of JRPGs because you know I've enjoyed other JRPGs. I think it's just Final Fantasy's gotten a little too out there for me. I definitely see. Yeah, Legend of Zelda winning that one. I mean, it's kind of... It would be surprising if it wasn't, right? It's going to be the second one on the uh, console as well, which is an unusual thing. So, moving along to best best visual design? Yeah, go ahead and best visual design. Uh, As I go on a complete tangent, right? And you're just there like, just shut up, I want to go to sleep. Uh, Elden Ring... Uh, Horizon Forbidden West, Cult of the Lamb, Ghostwire Tokyo, A Plague Tale Requiem, and Lost in Play with Elden Ring winning that one because, of course, right? Indeed. Cult of the Lamb has a very interesting style, but, you know, it's honestly a little derivative, you know? It has that kind of cutesy horror thing going on that, you know, kind of seen before, <laughs> right? Has a very, like, Don't Starve feel to it. Yeah. I don't just don't surf, Man, but lost, I I had to go look at Lost in Play and honestly, wow that that feels so much like a Flash game circa like two thousand three. Yeah, very dated looking. So All best right. multiplayer. Yeah, best multiplayer game: Elden Ring, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Shredder's Revenge, Multiverses, Platoon Three, Tiny Tina's Wonderland, and Lego Star Wars: The Skywalker Saga, and. Uh, the winner, surprise, surprise, was Elden Ring. Which, can you really call Elden Ring that much of a multiplayer game? I mean, I know, I know. It, but, right? I personally don't think so, but I know plenty of people think of it as one. Because you can do so much of the game with, with a partner. So, you know, I'm okay to let them have it. I mean, out of the... 
out of all these, I would ha- I would uh, vote for Splatoon. Uh, but then again, uh, error connection issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Indie game. Best indie game. Call to the Lamb. Tunic. Roller Drone. Dorfrenetic. It feels like somebody beat a keyboard with a cat there. Dwarf Romantic. <laughs> Neon White or Tear Down with Cult of the Lamb winning that one. I have heard nothing but great things about Cult of the Lamb. Granted, I haven't played it, so I can't confirm that, but I've heard it's excellent. About the um, only thing I've really heard negative about it is that they didn't quite get the length of the gameplay loop uh, correct, so you could have uh, a point where you're further in one than the other, which makes the other one a little bit tedious. Uh, essentially, Call of the Lamb is a management game slash dungeon crawler. And if you grind enough on the uh, kind of uh, cult management thing going on, you can kind of hit end game of that before you've completed the dungeon, which kind of negates a lot of the challenge of the dungeon for yeah. a while. Okay, let's see. Next. I, I, I just need to see what this dwarf one is. Dwarf Romantic? Well, I have it on my wish list. It's a oh, it's a peaceful building strategy game. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, that's why it feels familiar. It's uh, essentially... I uh, think you like Settlers of Catan building up a, uh, a map. Yeah. That's, that sort of thing. Okay. So the next category... Best gaming hardware. The Playdate, the Steam Deck, Analog Pocket, Backbone 1 PlayStation Edition, Rocat Cone XP, or Western Digital Black, SN850 NVMe SSD for PS5. Boy, they're really stretching for that one, aren't they? They're really stretching for that one. I mean, the winner was the Steam Deck, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. Based yeah. on... Honestly, I'm, surpri- this year. I'm, I'm surprised uh, with how much of a uh, darling it was to some of the YouTubers. Playdate didn't get it. Because, oh damn, some of the gamers that, or, or gaming YouTube channels I follow absolutely fell in love with the Playdate for a while. It's essentially a subscription, well I shouldn't say subscription, it's a, a broadcasted over time uh, uh, micro games, and it looks like a game or uh, Game Boy controls with a crank on the side, and uh, they'll release new games every couple weeks for it. And even if you get it later on, they'll you know it's a, a time thing where they'll release games to kind of simulate the experience of getting the new games. And people were going fucking nuts for it for a while. I see. All right, you turn. So, best game expansion. Final Fantasy fourteen and Walker. Destiny 2, The Witch Queen. Witch Queen? The Witch Queen. Cuphead, The Delicious Last Course. GTA Online, The Contract. No, no it isn't. Uh, Guild Wars 2, End of Dragons. Or Total War, Warhammer 2, Immortal Empires. With Cuphead, The Delicious Last Course winning it. Which rightly deserved. I haven't played it yet, but compared to what it's up against, right? Yeah. So here's a, a, a interesting one, right? Yeah. I mean, but why are you saying interesting? Uh, best game communities. Oh, you mean going to the next one? Sorry, I was looking yeah. at. Okay. Uh, I mean, Great. I mean, I really didn't have a lot to say on that one because it was like a bunch of MMO expansions, or you know, shitty uh, GTA. Uh, you know, pyramid scheme, and then, you know, an actual expansion to a game. Yeah. All right, so the next one, best game community. Dreams, Final Fantasy XIV, Grid Legends, No Man's Sky, Splatoon 3, and Warframe. The winner was Final Fantasy XIV. I don't know a lot about most of these gaming communities. I know a few communities to avoid, but otherwise, like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what would make them the best. I mean, I've played Warframe, and I've obviously played Splatoon. Uh, uh, Splatoon has a very welcoming community, for the most part. And also, there's a lot of furries in Splatoon. I mean, uh, go around the uh, square. It's like furry art over the place. 
It's like Jared's been on, uh, uh, you know, been on a rampage. Right. A spending spree. <laughs> uh, no, uh, remember, Nintendo's, uh, uh, you know, in yeah, terms of service, there's no dicks. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so Splatoon has been a very welcoming community. Warframe also, at least last time I played, was pretty chill for the most part. But yeah, it's also an MMO, and that's going to have a lot of people uh, on Final Fantasy fourteen. So, right? Yeah. So, best storytelling, hopefully, right? Immortality, Return to Monkey Island, Horizon for Ben West, Norco, I Was a Teenage Exocolonist, and Wayward Strand, which uh, with for uh, Horizon for Ben West winning it, which, right? Yeah, I mean, very heavy story games. Then you know, kind of more actiony game winning it, even though it's probably the most popular out of all of them, huh? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Next up, best audio. We are OFK, Xenoblade Chronicles Two, Metal Hellsinger, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles: Shredder's Revenge, Gran Turismo Seven, and Ollie. Oh, Ollie Ollie World. Uh, with the winner being Metal Hellsinger. Which, uh, based on the clips I've seen, rightly deserved. I mean, it's metal music, right? Yeah. Basically, uh, take uh, Doom and crank it up to 11 on the music side of things. So we're now to the Critics' Choices, which has no votes, it's just immediately the winner, so... Vampire Survivors got the Breakthrough Award. And I've looked at this game, and I'm trying to figure out why. I'm sitting here, it's like, this is like a horde shooter that yeah, I've seen quite a bit of. Am I just missing something here? Is there something going on that I don't understand? Uh, the reviews are not helpful in understanding why this is a breakthrough. Yeah. Uh, do I have the wrong game? It looks like a basically horde shooter meets like roguelike mechanics. It's just I don't get it. I don't either. But lots of people really like it. All so, right. Yeah, I mean So next Critics Choice Award went to Elden Ring. Woo. Woo. I mean good <sighs> good for it, I guess. Good for them. Yeah, and uh how about that? Uh Ultimate Game of the Year uh uh you know Turbo edition. Uh, Elden Ring, right? Yeah, I, I'm. I think Elden Ring just isn't my game, you know, uh, or the oh, whole yeah. you know, Bloodborne or Soulsborne, whatever genre. I, I just, oh yeah, that genre is not for me. I've never really, tr- yeah, tried to uh, to get into it, but it just seems like one of those that. I enjoy watching a, a little bit of gameplay, but it's just definitely not one to go into it because, ooh, all right, yep, all right, and the last one. Uh, there's another one. Uh, Critics Choice Award award, and then Ultimate Game of the Year. I, I said Ultimate Game of the Year. Oh, did you? Oh, I misheard you. I, I, I Although it's sarca- the same. I was being sarcastic. Ultimate Game of the Year Turbo Edition. Oh, I got you. Yeah, which was also Elder Ring, as you said, as you were just saying. I just mm-hmm. missed that that's what you were referring to. But yeah, it, I mean, it was this year's darling for most critics. and Yeah, especially, you know, on kind of like, uh, let's just go ahead and say AAA scale, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I'm happy for the people who really, really enjoy it. Like, I'm glad that they get to have that game. It's a very niche market that is being pretty well catered to and, and there and there it, are people some, who enjoy it uh yeah real stickers in the genre uh and there's a lot of mediocre games in that genre now that's you know it's kind of you know gotten a little bit more popular but it definitely seems like you know a, a really good game if you can get into it yeah so that but definitely doesn't not for me yeah so that does it for the Joystick Awards and our regular news topics. But we've got one Community Corner topic before we talk about it. Hey, Rage, how can people send stuff to Community Corner? Well, if you wish to do so, you can do so by emailing us, vglpodcast at gmail.com. 
Or drop by the Discord, which you can find a link to that over at vglpodcast.podbean.com. Woo. Indeed. All right. The community corner topic. Uh, the truth behind NVIDIA's melting dongles. Now, you watched this video. I did yes, not. Yes, I, I watched this like... A, okay, so we record on Tuesdays, okay? Yep. This video came out on Wednesday. And then we got in the community corner like Thursday, right? Yeah. So it pretty much made the entire community corner section of last week's podcast obsolete because it is something different than what uh, was originally suspected in the original uh, video. So the original video suggested that possibly there was some sort of defect with the different styles of dongles. So uh, this video card, it requires so much power that an 8-pin connector cannot supply it. So they are using a dongle that is converting two eight pins to a ten pin plus. Um, I, I think it's two or four cents uh, pins, but essentially they're combining two eight pins into one power source. Okay, from the power supply, and putting a massive amount of power through these uh, wires. And it was suggested that because there was a second version of this dongle being issued by some manufacturers that had a different power rating for some of the power uh, cables that either it was over uh, charging it or there was some sort of defect in the plug not quite essentially there's uh, a couple uh, factors uh, coming together to things Uh, gamers nexus did a uh, uh, a breakdown of this a, a lot more in depth than what i'm going to so if you're interested in this sort of thing and want to hear uh, a Steve's sexy, sexy voice and, uh, you know, long flowing mane, go for it, right? Essentially, they sent some of the cables that they were able to source from people that actually had cable failures and, you know, melting plugs uh, to a failure lab. And they found that there's debris in the actual plastic that might be contributing to it. Uh and creating some sort of weird uh, uh, thermal load. But the primary reason is twofold. One, the fact that the people are not seeing these cables correctly, and also a uh, possible latching issue with the cable. So whenever you're uh, inserting the cable, there's no real, like, audio click, and there's no, like... Uh, feedback that the cable has uh, latched into place. And the only way to really try to figure out if the cable is seated is to try to wiggle it back and forth. And it requires so much yeah, pressing in to get that cable seated that people have been partially seeing the cable. And because of vibration from the fan... Uh, the fans and just torquing on the cable, possibly you know doing cable management while you're, you know, doing the final assembly, or you know even just you know uh, thermal expansion contraction just from you know thermal load cycles. It slowly works that cable out, and because the way that the cable is pulled, mm-hmm. uh, essentially. Uh, Pretty much all the failure uh, cases that they that's been shown, and th- these are exceptionally rare. I want I want to add these have uh, been somewhere like zero point zero four or zero point zero four. Nvidia's uh, claimed that there's been about fifty failures uh, that's known, but it's also been amplified, you know, going around the internet. So right, so yeah. Uh, the way that the uh, cable is torqued, it's pulling uh, uh, the cord slowly out, and it creates a short circuit, which creates a high-resistance load, and quickly starts to overheat the plug, and then starts melting. And because the cable doesn't click all the way in, even though it feels like it's all the way in, and with some of the card secondary manufacturers having the uh, the plug recessed so you can't see that, you know, there's a little bit still visible, right? 
uh, it might be a tolerance issue on the plug, a design issue, but it's mostly user error, which, right? But honestly, with the amount of force that they're saying that you have to actually put in, I mean, that is a shitty design connector. You essentially have to put more force on that than you do putting RAM into a computer. And for anybody that's built a computer, putting RAM into a computer feels like you're murdering it. I just don't get how they put this, uh, you know, dongle situation in and then feel like this is going to cause issue later on. All right. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's pretty much just yeah, like. A combination of user error and possibly some sort of design flaw where they built the uh, plug with such tight tolerances that, you know, it's very easy to feel like you've completely seen the cable when you haven't. And possibly this might, yeah, this possibly has to go back to committee. This uh, uh, dongle is actually a industry standard cable uh, from a consortium of different hardware manufacturers. So they might have to take a look at the, this design and refactor it. So, right? Uh, any thoughts? Um, Hopefully man. I covered it all. <laughs> yeah, I feel like you did. I'm just, I'm tired and that's really starting to set in and it's harder for me to focus right now. I think... Do you need some coffee? I d- Yes, I need some coffee. I think that this is a, an issue that we'll probably see more of happen, honestly. Um, uh, especially as these high-end video cards are requiring continue to grow in, in their power consumption needs. Yeah, yeah, are requiring more power than, you know, like my entire computer. Yeah, same. Or if, or if not, then, you know, pretty damn close to it at this point. But I, I think we'll see more of these these things happening. Um, and, you know, hopefully lesson learned, getting, you know, get get better components or do something that's more bespoke instead of relying on, you know, adapters or whatever, like, you know, like hopefully lessons learned, less the chances of it happening in the future. Because if your customer, you know, melts their PC, you know, results in something even stronger than that, well, then you're hurting your customer base. And that's the only thing these companies give a shit about. So. I mean, that's the thing is that this isn't a, uh, you know, a bespoke piece. This is a industry standardized connector that... Uh, I'm not sure if this is the first time that's really been put into play or if it's just NVIDIA put it in a shitty way. But it's uh, a, uh, you know, uh, this is one that's, if this is the first time that's been used and it's, uh, you know, causing this much issue, it needs to be taken a look at. And it also seems like some of the connectors also have very different collecting mechanisms. Uh, they kind of went over that one point where uh, they talked about uh, there's like uh, one connector that has like p- pins on the side of the a plug, and there's another one that uh, is using like a a, a daisy uh, almost four springs, if I recall correctly. So it's yeah, you know, possibly uh, that as well, but needing to take a secondary look at this particular connector. And it could just be, you know, NVIDIA tried to squeeze, uh, you know, the specs a little too tightly. Or maybe they just need to include lube next time. Right? Be sure to lube up your dongle before you insert it. Yeah, you're tired. Uh, Otherwise, you'd be chucking about uh, lube dongles. Yeah. Yep. It's, uh, I'm going to be turning into a pumpkin soon. I, I think you're already orange. Oh, God. Help me. Kill me. Just kill me. <laughs> Before my hair gets like that really scraggly comb over look. Just kill me. What, you mean, uh, shredded wheat made out of, uh, candy made out of piss? Yeah, something like that. All right. Uh, again, where can people send us stuff? Uh, Podcast at gmail.com. You can drop by the Discord, which a link to that is over at vjlpodcast, uh, dot podbean.com, or you can, uh, Tweet us, uh, assuming it hasn't all burnt to the fucking ground yet. VTL Podcast on the Twitter. All right. And hey, Rage, why don't you hit him with your socials? 
Well, I've been Caffeine Rage. You can find me occasionally tweeting over at Gaming with CR, or if you want to be my friend on Steam, you can find me over at Caffeine Rage. And you've been? I have been Jared. You can find me uh, shitposting on Twitter for as long as the site is still going, at JMA4707. You can find me uh, streaming, well, not streaming specifically, appearing on streams of uh, tabletop games over at twitch.tv slash runicarts occasionally. And then you can find me on our Discord or Steam, where you can be my friend at jarrether4707. Woo! Woo! As I go back to the other tab, and uh, once again, Podcast at gbl.com with your letters, where smells, game-related topics. Tweet them to us, Podcast, or drop by the Twitter, which you can find a link to that over at vglpodcast.pondbean.com. Our lovely, lovely patrons have made this madness possible. You can find out more about that over at patreon.com slash Podcast. Our intro and outro music is on the ground by Kevin McLeod. You can find his work over at contentbutech.com. And as always, as his lovely music starts to roll across my very sleepy voice. And slow voice. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.